Hello, and thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Brian Wilkinson. Um, I'm an archaeological learning specialist uh, with my own freelance company, Heritage Journey Scotland. Um, I've, I have a particular interest in the historic environment, education, and outdoor learning. Um, I've undertaken many projects with schools and youth groups and adult groups um, within and for a wide variety of organisations all using the historic environment as a learning resource. I live and work in Scotland, lovely dry tropical Scotland, and much of my practice has been with school groups. Um, thanks Matt. My work supports teaching and learning in Scottish schools. Now, the Scottish school system is markedly different to that in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, the difference predates devolution by around 450 years or so. Um, since the re-establishment of the Scottish Parliament in 1999, the paths taken by Scotland and England have diverged considerably. The major difference is that within Scottish schools, there's substantial freedom given to teachers in what's taught and how within the bounds of a nat national guidance framework provided by the Scottish Government. There is no such thing as a national curriculum in Scotland. Rather, we have the curriculum for excellence, um, a far more progressive way of organising school learning than seems to be the case at the current moment in either of the other UK nations. Um, curriculum for, for excellence was introduced in 2004 and rolled out in 2010, so it's still rather new and teachers are progressively getting used to it. And it's a curriculum with a very small C. Um, it doesn't provide a prescriptive way of teaching across Scotland. Um, it doesn't specify a particular syllabus. Rather, it's an approach towards teaching and learning. So there are no statutory requirements in classroom topics. There's no government diktat on what teachers have to teach and when. Um, there's no standardised testing. There are no league tables. So. Um, this enables us um, to benefit from this in some way. Um, I suppose there's, there's, the teachers are not teaching to a test in order to get grades, in order to get a ranking on a league table. Um, so they have much more freedom to think about how and why and what they're actually going to teach the kids. Um, I don't really have time to go into its intricacies, but in brief, it's a curriculum designed to provide life skills. Its aim is to teach young people how to learn now and for the future. Um, it recognises the importance of developing the skills, insights and confidence to respond to the challenges and opportunities of our modern world. And it identifies four capacities, so the key priorities of education. So it's, it's, it's education's purpose in Scotland is seen as um, to enable young people to become successful learners, confident individuals, responsible citizens and effective contributors. And all learning in school is organised around those four principles. Okay. Um, so to develop, these, to develop these four capacities, each pupil at different stages of their school career has an entitlement to a range of experiences and outcomes through which they learn. Rather than a set of statutory standards against which people, um, pupils are assessed, Curriculum for Excellence is left for the classroom teacher to respond to and to interpret. There's greater latitude for customization to the pupil's interests and encouragement to use the particular context of the local community and the environment. So this is translated in the classroom through an emphasis on topic-based and interdisciplinary learning, so cross, a cross-curricular approach across the board pretty much, um, using skills and knowledge from more than one subject within any particular um, project. So the, the idea of this topic-led interdisciplinary approach is to make lessons more relevant and therefore more rewarding for the children. Um, additionally, teachers are encouraged to broaden their teaching practice by employing different pedagogies, um, different teaching methods. And one of these is outdoor learning. Um, broadly speaking, outdoor learning is any learning that takes place in school time beyond the school gate. Within education circles, there's been an exploration of its definition and practice over the past decade or so, seeing it progressively widen from a teaching method geared towards outward bounds adventure education um, to include investigations of the local natural environment 
and now to a more holistic investigation of place and this includes the historic environment. This particular project was one that I did uh, with a school on Deeside in Aberdeenshire um, and it combined elements of all, all, all three of those definitions. So it was about 450 metres up in the mountains, um, in the outside, in the natural environment and we were investigating an abandoned township as well. Um, another example, okay, um, this was in Argyle so, and it was a project called um, The Hidden Heritage of a Landscape run by local, the local community and um, local community development trust. It, in, it was an investigation of the isthmus between Tarbot and Araha, where legend has it um, in 1262, I think, um, Vikings dragged their boats from one sea lock to the other. Um, so they were investigating this story and investigating oh, the whole range of history and prehistory that could be found there as well. Um, the school project combined elements of history, geography, maths and art. We were also able to include drama, poetry, music and craft. We enabled the young people to contribute to survey and recording in a real and tangible way. And in turn they interpreted the findings that came through the archaeology and presented them to their community. Another example, growing up with Loch Leven, um, this is a partnership project between Historic Environment Scotland, um, uh, Scottish Natural Heritage and the RSPB. Um, it's an annual project undertaken with Kinross High School, so this is just uh, south of Perth, and it investigates the local area, um, the loch. This is the biggest landmark close to the school, pretty much. Um, I get to take them out to the castle, which is a quarter of an hour boat ride, um, over the loch, and there we aim to discover the who, what, where, when, whys and hows of its centuries long history and that of the surrounding shore as well. So we get to combine map skills, geography, simple planning, maths and studying the built fabric of the castle design to understand its strategic importance, its history. Um, so these are just some examples. It can be tricky to persuade teachers that outdoor learning isn't just rock climbing or a visit to the local farm, but little by little the message is getting across. The challenge is to show the relevance and benefit of getting out and investigating the historic environment. You have to show the teachers that it's um, beneficial uh, as, a, as a learning activity. Okay. Um, in understanding learning projects and in undertaking learning projects, I try to provide experiences and activities that are relevant, meaningful, and which present opportunities for cross-curricular learning. And I like to do this through an outdoor learning approach um, called place-based learning, um, which is something I hadn't heard of until pretty recently. Um, developed in the US by a researcher called David Sobel, um, place-based learning is learning rooted in the local areas and communities. It provides, it draws on local assets and seeks to reveal and make use of their potential as learning resources. So the outdoors um, effectively becomes an additional classroom. Um, it lends itself particularly well to investigating the historic environment. It's brilliant for it. And it provides, and the quote here is, place-based learning provides hands-on, experiential, real-world, authentic learning experiences. And if they don't persuade a teacher, I don't know what else will. Okay? It isn't solely about learning facts. Um, at a deeper level, it does a whole lot more. Okay? Um, so it enables, enables you to re-engage with place. It enables um, you to stretch pupils' brains to think about the hows and whys of, of why sites and monuments came to be. It gives them the chance to actually do archaeology, um, survey, if not excavation. Um, gives them the chance to do, um, you know, measuring, drawing, recording, uh, take photographs, video, do role play, um, sketch, plan. Um, Measure drawing, scale drawings, you know, that's maths, that's maths by stealth, if anything else. Um, you get to um, combine subjects to find thematic connections. You engage different learning modalities, get kids to work in teams, get them to understand place and appreciate conservation and sustainability. They also get fresh air and exercise, and they engage with local custodians and local experts um, close, to their, to, close to their school. So I can show you um, an example that I did last year with um, Forestry Commission Scotland that puts some of these into practice. 
So colleagues and I um, were appointed by Forestry Commission Scotland to write a teacher learning resource to support the curriculum for excellence and to encourage schools in North East Scotland to visit and make use of recumbent stone circles. So these are a particular kind of stone circle, very wide, they're unique to the north northeast of Scotland. Um, they're not found anywhere else. Um, very widespread throughout the region and many are on the Forestry Commission state. Many are also very close to schools, handily. Okay. So its, its publication in spring of 2015 coincided with the near complete solar eclipse of the spring equinox. So Forestry Commission in Scotland and I were presented with an opportunity to support the Curriculum for Excellence by making connections between um, this once in a generation astronomical event, so, and the other one won't happen until 2026 or something like that, um, the new teaching resource and a class of monument um, close to the schools which are kind of rela they are related to um, the, night, the day sky, the night sky, the sun, the moon, the stars, etc, etc. It was a rich opportunity that was too good to miss. So five primary schools local to two, to two stone circles were contacted and they were extremely eager to take advantage of the opportunity presented. Um, none of the schools were studying prehistory at the time, but some had done so previously. And this was a novel opportunity um, for, the, for them to revisit, if they'd done it, um, a previous topic. So they were keen to participate in. Um, I provided some ideas beforehand to revise learning. Okay, it's always a good idea to provide some context because it gives you a base upon which to, uh, to, to build when you're, when, you're, when you're talking to the young people. Um, so in the preparation, um, I asked them to imagine that they were a community living around 4,000 years ago in North East Scotland and who had come to a recumbent stone circle in order to witness a solar event and to celebrate the vernal equinox, the start of spring. So stressing that we don't know what ceremonies were held at these circles, I asked them to imagine and discuss what might have gone on at these sites. Um, so that's the context uh, setting a scenario to try and get them to, to, to imagine um, themselves into the past. And I gave them lots of links as well um, to easily accessible online sources um, to find out about life in the, uh, or what we as archaeologists have, have discovered about life in the late Neolithic and the early Bronze Age, the, the kinds of sites, monuments and material culture that we found. Um, to view the solar eclipse safely, I provided them with uh, eclipse viewing glasses and encouraged them uh, to decorate them. Okay, they were supplied with white glasses so they could colour them in using designs found on uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age objects. Um, prior notice was given on appropriate dress, behaviour, safety at the stones, um, the rules to follow when viewing the eclipse as well as meeting times, a running schedule for the event, transport and toilet arrangements. Teachers love this stuff, it's really good practice to, to, to do this for the teacher. Um, it makes life <coughs> extremely easy for you and for them. Um, so we convened at the Stone Circles, we convened there. Um, pupils were given a guided site tour by an archaeologist and aspects of life in the Neolithic and Bronze Age were interpreted for them by costumed interpreters and a storyteller. Connections were made between the significance of place in the present in the past, they were able to query the construct construction of the Stone Circles and their meaning to the communities who built them. They found out about how they're managed today um, and we also watched the eclipse. Um, they were able to, um, pupils and teachers were able to find out and learn about local sites. New partnerships were made between the schools, Forestry Commission Scotland, the Rangers Service, and we followed up with a CPT event, CPD event for the teachers so that they could um, go into more depth into the learning resource and find out about a handling resource which had also been um, collated to support the teaching pack. So what was learned? Um, by viewing the eclipse at the stone circles, we managed to cover a multitude of bases. Um, we combined, a, uh, we gave a practical demonstration of interdisciplinary learning. We combined social studies with science, technolo uh, technology, engineering, and maths, the STEM subjects. We enabled pupils to find out about custodianship, conservation, and management responsibilities of Forestry Commission Scotland. We enabled a new perspective to be given on what you know, might be seen by the kids as a mysterious archaeological site, um, helping them to understand their age and their use, learning about the life and times in prehistory. 
Um, we highlighted the possibilities of place-based learning and outdoor learning to the teachers who, who maybe hadn't, you know, hadn't thought about it previously. Student curiosity was encouraged through questions and answers with the archaeologists and the interpreters um, and through their initial preparation and the research as well. So a whole load of learning outcomes came out of this one simple project that didn't last more than two or three hours. Okay. So in my Scottish context at least, outdoor learning offers opportunities to find meaningful ways to include the study of the historic environment with a curriculum and to provide place-based learning to teach, to promote place-based learning as a broad and dynamic framework um, for, for teaching and learning. Um, I hope you can find some applicability within your own context. I encourage you to do so. And our top 10 tips um, provides a great starting point to do so. Um, so place-based learning, outdoor learning, it's serious fun, it's enjoyable, it's educational, it offers novel learning experiences that teachers might struggle to deliver alone. It supports young people's learning and encourages interest in their heritage and our subject. Um, but to what end? And I'd like to leave you with this provocation from Freeman Tilden, who says, if we cannot interest our <coughs> with our treasures those carefree young persons whose minds are at the height of receptivity, how can we hope to interest those adults who are inevitably fogged and beset by the personal and social worries of an uneasy world? Thank you very much. Thank you.